Good afternoon slash morning slash evening. Um, welcome to the first video of the introduction to our workshop series. Um, these videos match up with the introduction to workshop series that is run by QMI Burkhoff the Statistics Unit. Um, so it's an introduction to R in the context of biostatistics and health research. It doesn't really aim to teach biostatistics. It's more of an aim to teach R as it would be used for biostatistics and in health research. Um, so a quick bit of information about the statistics unit. So we offer a free service to Kioma Berghofer, Metro North and Marta Research. And we provide statistical consultancy. Um, we can work on collaborative research with you. We can do assistance with publication and also we offer training services such as these. And we are found in the Bancroft building of QIMR Berghofer. Um, if you want to contact any of us, these are our contact information. Um, hopefully before you come across these videos, you have the booklet um, that goes along with these workshops. So that's a large booklet that has all the material um, for the five workshops plus extra. So that book was really aimed to be a reference guide for both the workshops and for your future workings with R with a bit of extra information. Um, so there'll be nothing in the videos that aren't from the book as well. Um, the, so the book has a really great source of information, but the videos just um, aim to talk through it a bit more. And obviously the workshops, the hands-on workshops would be the best place to do it, but hopefully these videos complement them both. Um, hopefully also you've downloaded R and R Studio from those sites listed there. Um, they're both free downloads. Um, so hopefully you've got that done. There is some code there you can um, that you need uh, needs to be run to get some extra functions and packages for use in later workshop material and later videos. We won't need any of them today, um, but they will be needed for future videos. Um, there's also the data sets that should have come with the booklet. Again, we won't be needing any of those today. Future videos, yes though. Um, so this first video is from the first sections in the booklet. Um, where we'll just go over some of the basic stuff of what is R and R Studio, some R basics, different data types and object types, and functions. Um, this will be some fairly dry stuff, um, especially if you've done R before. This will be the fairly basic stuff. Um, even if you haven't done R before, and maybe if you haven't done any programming before, this will still be fairly dry. This isn't the amazing cool plots and stuff I can make. This is the really basic level stuff, so we get a good grounding in how we use R. Um, so normally in the workshops, we break it up with some jokes, with some fun little activities. Um, and I'm gonna try and make this video quick, um, so you can use the booklet, um, and some, the video will have some quick explanations. But by all means, feel free to pause the video and rewind, um, and just refer to the booklet and internet as much as you need. Um, because this isn't the most captivating stuff, but it is still all really important stuff. Okay, so what is R? Well, most importantly, R is free. It means you don't have to pay to use it. You don't have to pay a yearly license fee. Um, it is free to download on just about any computer you want. Um, that makes it really easy to both use at work and use at home and use it wherever you need to be. You're not limited to how many um, places you can have it, how many machines you can have it on. R is also open source. That means that it's not just the people who created R that have control over it, it's the public who can um, offer updates to R, offer patches, offer ways to not necessarily not fix things, but to improve things, to come up with new things to use in R. So because anyone can create things in R, um, there's a lot out there for you to use within R. As I've alluded to, R is a programming language, so it's not like other statistical software that's a bit more point and click. Um, you have to be a bit more manual with your programming skills and how you interact with data and do things within R. But R is used by many statisticians, scientists, and other researchers around the world. It's very popular. Now, what is R Studio? R, R itself is the underlying um, programming language, coding language that runs everything, that does all your data stuff, does all your testing. R Studio is a way that we interact with R. So as I'll switch across here to an R Studio window. So this is a typical R Studio window. 
Um, you can move things around. You can change default background colors. But this is what a default R Studio would look like. Um, there's lots of things in R Studio that you can use to make um, using R easier, but I'll just go over, over some of the basic things. So on the bottom left here, this is our console. Um, you'll, if you've looked at what the basic R um, software, if you run that and what it does, it basically just gives you a window where you can run a single line of code or source code through it and the output comes to it. That's basically the same as the console here. The console is where we can enter code and get output. Um, and that's where every that's where, that's where R is run and where we can get the output from R. Above that, we have our script editor. So a script is a, just a collection of code in a file. So we can write lots of lines of code from our whole project up here. Um, and we can edit our code that way and run large sections of code at a time and just work on it rather than just entering it one line at a time. The real difference between a script and the console is that down here you'll have this little arrow on the left and when the arrow appears there it means R is ready to receive another line of code. Um, if you run a really long bit of code that takes R a while to work through, that arrow will disappear for a while and then when it reappears it means R is ready to do something else. Whereas up here in the script file there is no arrows, um, there's just the straight code. You don't have to write the arrow yourself, that's just an r, &R Studio thing. Um, if, within the booklet that goes along with this, you'll note that all the code examples have the arrow at the front. So the code there is basically taken from the console. And that means if you want to copy the code across into the console or into a script, uh, you'll need to remove the arrow that's at the front of every line. While we're looking at the script files, we can see all these hashtags or hash or pound signs, what you want to call them. Um, these are commented lines. So when we're working in a script file and we want to make a little note for ourselves to tell us what this code is doing, um, we can write a line of code and have a hashtag at the front of the line. And that means that R will know that this line of whatever won't be processed by R. It's just going to be ignored. We know that whatever is on the line after the hashtag is just for us to look at, to understand what's happening. It's not for R to look at. Um, so the, so all, and it's in a different color here. You may not be able to tell that yet, um, but that way you can distinguish and you can write notes for what your code is doing, which can be really useful. So that's a little script in the script editor there. Over on the top right, we have the environment tab. Um, we'll talk more about stuff like this later in the video and later in other videos. Um, the environment tells me everything that is currently in my R environment. So any objects I've made, any data I've called in, anything I've created, um, it just lists all the things that are there. And if I look, if I want to look, um, if you look at any of the data sets that I have in my environment, I can double click on them and the data frame or data set will appear here next to the, in the same window as the script editors. So if I have a large data set that I want to look at, it can also be viewed here next to the script files. Then we'll just quickly look at the bottom right. Um, lots of tabs here, but one of the ones we'll look at is the plots tab. If I make any graphs or plots, this is where they'll appear. Um, packages, so packages are what we, and we'll talk about this later in another video. Um, packages are extra code that we download from the internet to use. Um, so these are all the ones that I've downloaded onto my computer. And if I call any of them from my computer into my R session, a tick would appear saying, yep, they're in this R session. We also have the help tab. So that's where we have help documentation. So I can search for other help files here and search within the help file here as well. Um, again, that was really quick just to point out some of the major parts of the R Studio. There are many more parts to R Studio that you can use. Um, we don't really have time to go through all of it. And again, that was very quick. Feel free to pause, rewind, and go through it again by yourself. I'm trying to make these videos fairly short um, so there's not too much um, to, that you have to sit through. Okay. So. R at its most basic is just a really big calculator. Just like 
computers in general are just really big calculators. R is just a, a calculation software. So at its most basic level, it does things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So if I go back across to my R Studio, Oh, that's one thing I probably forgot to mention with the comments is that depending on your version of R Studio and possibly your operating system, if you have a line of comments, a commented line that ends in four hashtags, that basically becomes treated as a section heading, which is collapsible. And also you can search through your file with um, description headings that way. So here I have a line of code, one plus one, because R is just a big calculator and it can calculate that. So what I can do is I can highlight that line of code and hit control enter. And that line of code gets sent down to my console and evaluated by R and R evaluates one plus one as two. No surprise there. I can also, as I probably mentioned before, just use the console. So I can do two times nine there in the console, hit enter and R evaluates that line of code. If I want to do multiple lines of code at a time, I can highlight multiple lines of code. So I want to do all the three of these operations at once. I can highlight all three lines of code, hit control enter, and R evaluates all three of them at once. So one plus one is two, two times nine is 18, and 16 minus nine is seven. If I want to run just a single line of code from my script file, and I don't want to have to highlight it each time, what I can do is I can just have my little cursor on that line of code, hit control enter and R evaluates that line of code of one plus one and evaluates it as two. And the cursor moves to the next line with code in it. And so I can step through my lines of code that way, doing one line of code at a time, just hitting control enter at each line. Um, normally in the workshops, this would be a point to pause it and just have a go doing that yourselves and get a handle of either working in the script file or putting code into the, sorry, working typing code into the console and running it or writing code into the script file um, and running it there. Oh, one thing I should, maybe should have mentioned, if you want to make your own script file and or that didn't appear for you, there is a button here on the top left that makes a new script file for you, that little plus sign with a white sheet behind it, that'll make a script file for you. But by all means, pause the video um, and try doing some of this stuff yourself. Just play around with it, get a feel for a, putting code in the console or writing code in the script and entering it. Um, and we can feel free to pause or just continue along the journey with me. So another basic part of R and really of programming language is assignment. We can save values or large collection of data as objects within our R session for later use and for more easy use. Consider it like algebra, where we had letters that represented numbers. Um, same thing in R, we can make an object, call it a letter, call it a word, come up with some weird name for it, and we can save large data or small data within that. Um, R is pretty unique in that there are two symbols or two little bits of code to do that. So we can just use an equal sign and just say this object equals this data or this value. Or we can use the other little assignment code, which is looks like a little arrow, which is made up of the less than symbol and a hyphen. So it makes it like a little arrow of the value being pointed towards the object it's going to be saved as. Um, so here in our studio, what we're going to do is we're going to save the object A and we're going to give it a, assign it a value of two. So with my cursor on that line, I'm going to hit control enter. And I can see across in the top right in my environment that A is now there and it has a value of two. I want to confirm that. I might go down to my console here and just type the letter A and hit enter. And R is telling me that, yep, A is two. That's what is saved in A, that's, that's the information that's there. Now I can use the information saved in A um, 
for other things, more such as addition and multiplication, or really in any way. But I don't necessarily have to refer to the data in A, I can just refer to A itself. So here, with this A plus three, I can just control enter on that, and R will process that as two plus three, because it knows that A is equivalent, is containing the value two, and so it evaluates five. Same as A times five, Sorry, did I say A is five? Sorry, A is two. Um, A is two, so A times five is 10. I can process that um, quite easily. And that might seem like a weird, not very useful thing at this stage, um, but we, when we deal with bigger data sets, when we deal with lots of data at a time that we're doing lots of things too, or we're dealing with values that we want to change, assignment can be very useful. Um, so the objects that we name and assign values to, um, we can name them almost anything. R is case sensitive though, so there'd be a difference between a lowercase a and an uppercase a. Um, and there are some rules. So for example, we can't have a space in an object name. R just won't consider that all the one thing. Um, but we can call it whatever we want. We can add hyphens. We can have mixtures of capitals and lowercase. We can put full stops in there underscores and numbers, we can't start with a number though. So you can't start an object name with a number. And there are some symbols that are forbidden for object names such as the exclamation point. Again, I'm rushing through this really quickly. Feel free to pause the video and do some of the activities that are in the booklet, do some more of the examples. Um, the best way to learn R is by doing and just practicing yourself. So feel free to pause and go do that and then come back and we can keep moving forward. Now, one important thing to get an understanding of is logic. Logic might seem like a really weird thing or a not really useful thing if you're trying to do by statistics, but logic is one of those basic skills that just makes everything a lot easier. Um, so it might be a bit of a weird concept, but it's really important to get an understanding of. So R can, it, like all, programming languages and computers, R can evaluate logical statements and give a true or false outcome. Um, so for example, a question might be, is this value less than this other value? R will be able to evaluate that and say true or false. So a logical statement is basically anything that can be answered as true or false. Some examples of that are less than or less than or equal to. We could do greater than or greater than or equal to. We could do, are these two things equivalent to each other? And we notice we do that with double equal signs, not just a single equal sign, otherwise you might be assigning things. You could do not equivalent to, so are these things not the same, um, with an exclamation point and an equal sign. And we can also combine logical outcomes with or or and. So, yeah. First one here that we're going to look at is three less than seven. So if we evaluate three less than seven, R says, yep, that's true. And R's true or false values are true in all cups or false in all cups. So if we do three is greater than seven, again, my cursor is just on that line of code at line 91. Control enter, R evaluates three greater than seven and says that's false. We can do equivalency with, with three equivalent to three, which is true, and three equivalent to seven, which is false. We can also do it with characters. So is the word word equivalent to the word word? Yep, those two words are equal in every single way. So they're equivalent. But if is word lowercase equivalent to word in all caps? No, they're different because one's lowercase, one's uppercase. So in the equivalent sense, that's false. Like we said before, there are ways to combine true and false outcomes. So one way is or, and or is just that straight up and down line. Um, on the keyboard I have, it's the symbol that's below backspace. Um, so when you combine two true or false outcomes with or, or is basically asking, are either of these two things true? So true or true is true. False or false is false, but true or false is true, because it's basically saying is one of these two values true, 
if it's true or false or false or true, the answer is true. And on the other hand, with this little and ampersand symbol, it's basically saying, is both this first value and this second value true? So true and true is true, false and false is obviously false, but true and false is false because not both of those things are true. Again, that might be a lot trying to process all at once, might be just chucking a lot of information at you, that's fine. Feel free, pause, go back, or skip ahead, um, skip ahead and come back to it a different time. It might make more sense when we start doing this in, more practical, in a more practical example. Um, this is just trying to expose you to some of the basic skills that we need to work in R. Okay. Again, okay, now we're gonna be looking at data types and object types. So we can make objects in R that contain values and data, and those objects can have different types depending on how we structure the data we're putting in there and what types of data are going in there. Because each of the data can also have different type, types. Again, this bit it can be very technical, so don't worry if you, if you don't absorb it all at once. There's always a booklet to refer back to. You can always pause and rewind. You can always come back to it once you've had a, a chance for it to tick away in the back of your head. So one type, of, one type of value is a numeric value. So numeric values are essentially just numbers. So two, the value two is a numeric type value, but two A is not numeric. Only data that is purely numbers can be numeric. Now these numbers can be positive or negative, they can be a whole number or can have decimals. Basically any type of just number, as long as it's just number, can be a numeric value. Similar to that, we have integer values, and they're like numeric values, because they can only be numbers, but they can only be whole numbers. It might seem weird why we have to have both numeric values and integer values. Um, it's, in some ways, integers it can be useful because they require less storage than numeric. Sometimes they can do things in a different way, but generally, it doesn't matter if numbers are stored as numeric or integer, it might just be something to be aware of. Um, for most things you do, it's not gonna make a big deal, but it is important to be aware of. Um, another type of value is the character value. So this is just text, and it's distinguished by the types because every, everything in a character value is enclosed in quotation marks. So for example there, the character value is the two words, my text with a space in it. Now a character value can be text of any length. A character value can just be a single letter, a character value can be a whole sentence or a whole paragraph. A single character value is just whatever you enclose within two quotation marks. Um, so it's, what I'm trying to say is that a character value isn't a single letter or symbol, a character value is just any combination of text that is enclosed within a pair of quotation marks. Again, that might seem a weird explanation. I think when you when we start dealing with more with more um, examples of character values, it might make a bit more sense. You can also have logical values. So these are the results of those logical statements we were just talking about, and we can store the outcome of those statements as a logical value or of a data type. So that's that is data that can only be true or false, and we can store that true or false. Um, within R as something. Now we'll look at the data structures of how we're storing these different um, value types. We can have what's called a vector. So a vector is a collection of elements, each of the same type. So for example, for example on the right there, of the vector my vector is three numbers, 10, 15, and seven. So they're all numeric, or they might be all integer, but they're all the same type, and that's just a little collection of three numbers. If you try making a vector of elements of different types, I will coerce them to be all the same. So if you try and make a vector of a couple of numbers and then some text, I will try and convert them all to text because a vector can only contain the same type of data. A matrix is an extension of vectors, except they now have two dimensions. 
all that data is arranged into rows and columns. So back there in the vector, that was the previous example, there was that one in a square bracket. Um, square brackets are used to denote where something is in a data structure. So that one is referring to the 10, saying that the next thing you read is the first part of the data structure. If we had a really long vector, that was say 30 numbers in it and we couldn't fit all 30 numbers on the console screen and it went across two lines, on the second line, there'd be another little square brackets with a number saying, cool, we're now at the 21st element of the vector. So the square brackets are just saying where in the vector, we're, um, where in the data structure we're looking. For the matrix, we also have square brackets there, and they're telling us which row or column we're looking at. So the, the one, two, and three in the square brackets on the left-hand side there, um, they're saying that it's in the first row, the second row, or the third row. R, like a lot of other programming, programming languages to find things in terms of rows and then columns. So that's why there's numbers there before the commas. Whereas for the columns there, we have the column one and column two, it's comma and then the number. Um, so for example, the number 10 in my matrix is in the first row in the first column. The number 12 is in the third row in the second column. And that's how we can describe where those data are within the matrix. Um, in the data structure. The extension of matrices is arrays. So they're like matrices, matrices except they have more than two dimensions. So they can have three, four, five dimensions. Um, in this example here, we basically just have two matrices on top of each other. So there's the first two dimensional matrices, then on top of that, in the second part of the third dimension, this is another matrix. Again, we're not likely to deal with arrays in a lot of biostatistical data. It's not a very common thing. We generally have our data sets that are just two dimensional. Um, but it's good just to be aware of things like that and what they may be, because um, they can be sometimes common in R. Um, a list is very similar to a vector, except it kind of um, works around that rule where everything has to be the same by having the possibility that the element can be anything inside a list. So each element in the list can be any data type. The element can even be another data structure. So the example in my list there, the first element, which is denoted by those, denoted, sorry, by those double square brackets, that first element is a single, is a vector with a single element with the character value male. The second element, which is the two inside the square brackets, has a, just a single numerical value 87. And the third element in, list, in the list is a single logical value true. Now, each of those elements could be a much longer vector, could be an array, could even be a whole other list. Um, a list, list data structure in R is kind of like, if you would try hard enough, you can put whatever you want in there and make it however you want it to be. Now, the data frame is probably the most important data type for doing by statistics in R. Um, the probably one you'll use the most. So it's similar to the rectangular database format where you have variables in rows and cases or I'm sorry, variables in columns and cases or records in rows. Um, essentially the data frame is just a collection of variables that all have the same number of rows. So each column can have a variable name and a column has to contain the same type of data like variables in all data sets do. So for example, there's that first variable in the data frame is sex, and it can handle the male or female, you're not gonna have numbers in there. And then we have the variable age, which contains the age of the, in the data set. R knows that in a data frame, the values in different columns that are on the same row correspond to each other. So R, R will know from that data frame that the, the first row record, the male, sex and the 28 age match up to the one case. Um, this will match most data sets we use in biostatistics and help research, which is probably why it's the most common one you'll come across. One other thing to be very um, aware of when you're looking at data types and object types is the factor data structure. So factors are used for categorical variables where your variable isn't necessarily um, it's not continuous, it has set values it can contain, and those are the categories the variable can be. 
Um, so a factor is stored in two components. First, it can, the first component is a vector of integers, so a vector of ones, twos, and threes, etc. And the second component is another vector that maps character strings to those integers. Um, so when you're viewing the data, you'll see the character labels, um, but R is storing it all as ones and twos and threes. So for example, if we wanted to have a vector that stores the gender of 30 people, rather than having 30 character values saying male or female, um, we could have a factor that stores a vector of ones and twos, and then another vector that stores the information that one is female and two is male. So when we call the information out of that variable, I will, uh, I will process the ones and twos and replace them with male and female for us, but it's just storing it as ones and twos inside. Um, this can be very useful. It's kind of like um, the coding you might do yourself in a data set of the storing it, everything as numbers and having a separate little thing saying what these numbers mean. It has many uses um, inside R and how to process it. And so a lot of things will be treated as factors for different analysis and tests. Um, but it's something to be aware of and it's good to be aware of how exactly a factor is structured that way. Um, and we'll mention this in later videos as well when we come to data cleaning. Cool, that was a lot. If that was a lot for you, feel free to take a break, pause, grab a cup of tea. Um, again, I'm aware this video is a lot of the very nitty gritty boring stuff and we're going to do more nitty gritty boring stuff with functions. R is basically built on functions, um, like most programming languages are. A function is something, a bit of code, a bit of script that performs a specific procedure. Um, it may require inputs, it may require many inputs, or it may not require inputs at all. Um, but a function will essentially either produce some output for you, so it'll make something, or it will cause some kind of change within your R session or your R environment. So that output could be a transformation of some data, it could be a summary statistic of that data, it could be the results from a test or a model or something much more complicated, um, or it could just change the environment in some other way, like you might enter a function that changes the default values for graph margins or something like that. Um, but functions either give you something or they change something. Um, the syntax for basic R functions is fairly consistent. So you'll have the name of the function, which is one word. It is case sensitive, keep that in mind. And then immediately after the function name is the round bracket where all the arguments go, or the, all the inputs go. Um, so the arguments are the names of the inputs the function needs. And then the, in this example here, the inputs is the data we're giving to match up to that argument name. So functions can have many arguments. So its first argument might have a specific thing that it wants, and then we'll give it the value in input one, and then comma on the name of the second argument that the function wants, and we'll give it the value of input two using the equal sign. Here, we just use the equal sign. We don't use the little arrow that we would have done in assigning. Here is just equals. Now, another way to do functions, if we know the order of the arguments, like we know which one is argument one and which one is argument two, we can just put the values that we're gonna to input to those arguments in brackets in order separated by commas. Again, that's a lot. So let's go and look at some examples. Um, one of the reasons I want to make it really clear that we, um, the space comes right after the function name is that we've, in a couple of times, we've done two plus two with spaces and it's been fine, or we can do two plus two with no spaces and it's read the same way. So there are some times in R when, when, when spacing doesn't really matter. However, in functions, we can't have a space between the function name and the round bracket or the parentheses. They have to come right after each other. Okay, first we're gonna look at the function round that rounds numbers. So the first example here, we've got the name of the function round. Um, it's all in lowercase. We have sort of the function name, 
we have straight away that round bracket. Now the first argument name is x. So x is the first argument. And what we give to x is the number we want to round. So in this case, that number is 27.128654. Then we have a comma. And after the comma is the name of the second argument, which is digits. And that's how many decimal places we want to round the number to. So we've gone the name of the second argument, digits, and we've made that equal to two, because we want to round it to two decimal places. So I can either highlight that, that line of code and run it, or just have my cursor at the end of the line there and hit Control Enter. That line of code gets sent to the console, processed, and we have 27.13, which is the number rounded to two decimal places. Now, one cool thing about in the console is we can, if we click in the console and the little cursor is there, if we use the up arrow, we can go up through the previous code we've run. And if we go up to a previous code and we're using the left and right arrow, we can edit that line of code. So this can be a way to, if you've run some code and it didn't work the way you wanted to, you can quickly up arrow and then change it. Um, we can do things that way. So one thing, another thing with functions is that not all inputs are necessary. So what I mean by that is if we didn't give the function a, an input for digits, the function will still work, but it will use its default value of digits of 27. Of default value of digits of zero, meaning it rounds a number to no decimal places, meaning the answer is 27, sorry. So some inputs do have default values, which means the function will work fine if you don't give it an argument input. Um, obviously, not all arguments have default values. For example, x doesn't have a default value. It, the function really does need um, a number to round if it wants to round something. Um, like we said before, if, if we know the name of the argument, and we, or we know what, like, the order of the arguments in. We don't necessarily have to name the argument. Um, if we assign a code, I can just run round 27 and have the round round bracket 27.128654 closed round bracket. And I can just run that and I will know, all right, that's the number that's there. That number is going to have to go to the first argument, which is the only argument that needs an input and it will deal with it that way. So generally you can get away with not having to name the argument names in really simple functions. Um, if you're only relying on the default behavior of the function, so you don't want to change what the default behavior is. But if you do want a change from the default or a function has a lot of inputs and you want to really make sure that the right input is going to the right argument, that's when it's really useful to name the arguments. But for a lot of simple things like this round, if we know we're only going to, if we know we want no decimal places, we can just type around and then not say what the argument names are. Cool, our next, next example. There is the function C, which is the function that makes vectors. Now, some people say C stands for construct. Some people say C stands for combined, some for concatenate. It doesn't really matter. It's just the C function. So just the function name is just C, lowercase c, round brackets, and then all the elements we want to be we want to put into the vector separated by a comma. So C one comma four comma six comma ninety. Control enter. That line of code goes to the console, and my output is a vector of one four six and ninety. Cool. So now that's how I can make a vector with those four numbers in it. But say I wanted to use that vector for something, or I wanted to do something with those collection of numbers. The best thing for me to do is to assign that vector to something so I can keep using it in future lines of code. So what I can do here, I've got, I'm gonna make this object called vec. I'm gonna use the assigning arrow. And then on the other side of the assigning syntax, I'm gonna write that line of code that produces the output vector. So what this is going to do when this is run is the C function is going to make that vector output and that output is going to be assigned to vec. So control enter. 
notice nothing is printed to the screen there because rather than the output just being going to the screen, so I want to see what the output of making a vector is, the output has gone and made this object vec and I can see in my environment there is this vec here that has four numbers in it. If I do want to see vec printed to the screen, there is the print function which will just print whatever object, the data within that object to the screen. Or I can just type vec down here and hit enter. And the data within vec is printed to the screen. What you may have also seen there is that RStudio does have an autofill, fun autofill functionality. So generally after you've typed three letters of something, RStudio will try and figure out and offer you suggestions of what you might be typing. So it might give you other function names or other objects, and you can scroll through and figure out which one you want. Now, I just showed you two ways to print the data in something. You might wonder why that's necessary. Um, like, isn't print doing the exact same thing as just typing vec? Sure, it's basically doing the exact same thing. Um, in more complicated situations, print does things differently than if you just type the object name and hit enter. Print can sometimes give you more information if your object is a bit more complicated. And there are some situations where print will definitely make sure that your thing is getting printed to the screen. This is an aside and it's a useful thing to know that the print function is there. Cool. And now we'll quickly look at the seek function. So SEQ means seek, it's the sequence function. So the seek function is gonna make a vector that is a sequence of numbers. It's gonna start at the number I give to the argument from go up to the number I give to the argument two, and go up in steps by the number I give to the argument i. So basically what it's doing is gonna make a vector that has a sequence of numbers from one to 15 by steps of one. If I just highlight just this part of the code and not the start part with the assigning, and hit control and run that, that whole thing gets printed to the screen there. So I can see it's one, two, three, all the way up to 15 but I can just have my cursor there on the line, hit control enter. And now the object numbers is in my environment that has the numbers from one to 15. Again, control enter on just the numbers name and numbers is printed to the screen. So numbers is a vector of numbers. The object numbers is a vector of numbers and I can do functions on that vector of numbers. So for example, there's the max function max finds the maximum of a vector of numbers. So if I type, got there, max bracket numbers, I control enter on that, the max function takes that input of the vector of numbers, finds the maximum and outputs that maximum to me. Max needs to work on a vector of numbers, um, which is why I've made that, num that vector first. Another function there is min, so I've got finds the minimum, so min bracket numbers, control enter there, the minimum number is one. I've also got the function main, which is handily over here in my help help um, help documentation window as well. Cursor is on that line, control enter, it finds the mean of the numbers. Like I just mentioned before, these functions work on a vector of numbers. When you look up what functions do and you consider what their arguments are, their arguments have to be of a certain type. Obviously, we can't just put in um, the text names of numbers and expect the functions to figure out what it is. It'd be really nice if they did sometimes. Um, but sometimes the functions aren't built that way. So it's good to know what how the functions work and in the future videos we'll look at how we go around about figuring that out. But these three functions work on a vector. We can't just type mean and put the numbers in there that we want to find the mean of. That's not going to work. Obviously one isn't the mean of those five numbers. Um, however what it does do, what it does need is it needs a whole vector and needs all those numbers stored as a vector. So if I type it like this, and this is called nesting functions, and we'll talk about this in future videos. What that's basically gonna do, the C function is gonna make a vector of all those numbers, and then that output from that 
um, vector making function will go into the main function and then main can work on the vector. Um, I could have done that with numbers too and just had this that seek function inside the max, min, and main. But if I know I'm going to be doing the same thing to the same, or if I'm no, I'm going to be doing different things to the same vector, sometimes it's just useful to make um, that vector an object so I can just keep referring to that object rather than the code to make it all the time. Now, again, that's a lot of information presented fairly quickly. By all means, go back over the video a few times, read through the book, come along to the workshops next time they're run, um, and just practice doing R. I get that it was a lot thrown at you, but really the best way to learn R is to do R and just to practice with a few different things, make up your own vectors, um, practice with different functions, practice with different things. There are examples in the booklet. Um, there are activities in the booklet. I really just encourage you to learn R by doing. Um, so this is the end of the first video. There will be others. Um, and hopefully I see you then. Thank you very much.